Okay, so picking up where I left off um, in New Zealand uh, with respect to the Canterbury settlement, um, the crux of the argument or the, the purpose of the video mainly is to show you this type of thing is going on or went on, and that is the untold or little told history um, tells us a lot when we think about it. They are saying that they organized a colony in such a way that entire towns were planned slash built before settlers arrived. These towns would be like a community back in England with landowners, small farmers, and workers, and with churches and shops and schools already built, and not to mention train stations, um, defense fortifications, castles, uh, the list goes on and on, uh, technologies that were developed and then uh, awaiting rediscovery were torn down, but the telltale signs were still there. And so, uh, so we'll go, we'll come back to this about Christ Church in New Zealand. Um, but let's, let's pick up where we left off. And that is precisely here. I was showing something and this is from the National Museum of the Royal New Zealand Navy. Okay. So what do you think of if you're in charge of the Royal New Zealand Navy? Wouldn't you like to say that you have a proud history? Well, let's take a look and see what they do say with respect to their history uh, and specifically the battlements, the coastal defenses that they built up, which other than their seafaring vessels are some of their most proud monuments that uh, tells a lot about their origins and, and such. So you would think that they would have a proud history, maybe humble beginnings, but Humble isn't embarrassing, right? Well, let's see. Right off the bat, they're talking about, you know, and I'll just do it. I like, I love to do this in the voice <clears throat> because I kind of hear this voice when people say, UAP, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just a num num. And, and those defenses were already there and you don't know what you're talking about and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, all right. You can think that. That's fine. But let, here, let's just read what they have to say about it. There is a fundamental flaw in the traditional reliance on the Royal Navy. The apparent protection offered by the Australian squadron, which had been based in Sydney since 1848, was made inadequate by both its lack of strength and disposition. Ooh, slam, right out of the gate. They're slamming the Aussies. So they felt that if New Zealand made some effort to defend itself, then the Royal Navy might be more freely forthcoming in an emergency. How would they even know? So they're saying, you know, the Aussies, those lazy sons of bitches, they wouldn't even help us. They would let us die at the hands of the Germans or the Chinese or whoever, because they're just a bunch of no good, do nothings. They just are worthless, but we're even more worthless. So let's make a show, an effort to like act like we're trying to defend ourselves, even though we're not. And then that'll kind of trick them into coming and actually defending us, which is their job under the royal crown that seemingly has no authority over them out here. Wow. You know. um, so to meet the danger of unexpected attack, 22 64 pounder guns were promptly ordered from Britain, but no sooner had they arrived than the scare abated and the familiar pattern of procrastination reasserted itself. Well, we're a proud history. And they were invited, uh, they invited someone to advise on the disposition of the new guns in 1880 with the warning that recommendations that cost too much wouldn't be accepted. Okay. Well, hey, we got all these guns. We don't know what to do with them. We need you to disposition them. Are they useful? Do we put them in storage or do we scrap them? Because we don't know what to do with the dumb, because we got these guns and we don't know what to do with them. Like, what are they even for? So they have to hire somebody to come and, 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 and we have to warn you. If, if you tell us to do anything that costs money, then we're not going to accept that. And the, the recommendations of the government um, uh, were to put them into storage, okay? 
So. Okay, so. Um, they wanted they they had to react to the colony's deteriorating finances, and so they just put them in storage. It'd be too expensive to just do the last little percent and mount them up. So, well, okay, that's understandable. At least um, economically, they are thinking in terms of, you know, you don't spend money based on a sunk cost. You know, oh, we've already put so much money into this, we can't let it fail. Now we have to put more money into it. Well, no, you don't make business and economic decisions based on sunk cost. Now let's remember that, okay? We're gonna revisit that in a little bit. So um, so they, what did they do then after that? They ordered more guns, six inch and 10, eight, or 13 six inch and 10 eight inch loaders were bought. And they only, and then they set up one of the stored 64 pounders, but nobody saw it because they said, well, you know, we put mines all around the gun emplacements and nobody saw them build it, but oh, well, they were hastily constructed in all the major harbors according to a scheme. All right, uh, I know scheme, yeah, 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 scheme, okay. So, um, that's fine. Let's see what else they have to say here. Um, the 1885 works had been built in haste and provided at best a rudimentary defense system. In other words, it was worthless, whatever they did. You couldn't see it anyway because they had mines around it, so you just have to take their word for it. And so at this point, you know, it's been worthless. They haven't been able to do anything, so what? what's next? Well, after it's already been done, the task of redesigning and constructing new positions was given to somebody for a much more sophisticated defense system than that which was thrown up in 1885. So it's basically, it was puke. <laughs> um, it was most concerned to develop the mine defenses which had received scant treatment in 1885. Man, what a bunch of clowns. What the heck are they doing? And uh, water mines, you know, they run across the harbor at Bastion Point um, because of, well, okay. So the value of spar torpedo boots was revisited um, torpedo boats, I mean, that sounds like speed boats, you know, like, did they have those? I guess, what, I guess so, and the word comes from somewhere. Um, who knows what they really look like, I don't know, torpedo boats. But it had to be something different than what I think of a torpedo boat now, but maybe not. Officially, I'm sure it is. Uh, but they were revisited as their poor sea-keeping qualities made them hazardous when dropping whitehead torpedoes in anything but calm conditions. Okay. I have no idea what technology this is in like late 1800s, whitehead torpedoes and torpedo boats. It's all new to me. I didn't think they had that stuff back then, but maybe, maybe it's just names for something different. So the existing boats were dropped from the defense plan and broken up in the early 1900s. So they built a bunch of torpedo boats, never used them, and 10, 15 years later, broke them up to pieces. Right. During 1887, the impetus to complete the plan began to wane once again. Oh, you know, they just got tired of thinking about it. What the, what the heck does defense matter? If, you know, the Chinese want to come, Japanese, Koreans, you know, we don't want to bother with defending ourselves in any way. Reduce the urgency to complete the defense work. So they started to build it and they just went and stopped. Nevertheless, Premier Rowan Atkinson, a.k.a. Mr. Bean, no doubt influenced by Governor Gervois, to, determined to pour the decreasing defense budget into completion of the harbor defense system in an effort to prevent the waste of money already spent. So remember the thing about the sunk cost earlier, where they stopped right before completion because they didn't see the point in spending more money on something that wouldn't be necessary, no matter the fact that they had already spent it. Well, then they let it get dilapidated and t let time pass. They broke some of it up and then they decided to make it a priority and spend money on it because they had already spent money on it. <laughs> oh, and it gets better. I mean, just with time here. Um, so um, over 200 prisoners were employed. <laughs> That's why, no, you know, hey, I don't know anybody. I, I don't live there or never did, but it'd be like, 
I don't know anybody who worked. Did you? Do you have any relatives? Do you know anybody who worked on building this? No, I don't know. What well, was built by prisoners? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any relatives in prison and prisoners building. Well, you know, who's going to verify this? But these prisoners were employed in the main harbors to quarry stone, collect sand for masonry and concrete, and work the varied machinery. Sure. Absolutely, I believe you 100%. I promise, though I am being heavily sarcastic. The custom built stone barracks for 40 prisoners still stands today as the oldest building on North Head. So, a temporary project, a temporary project by prisoners. And 200 is interesting because the 200 Book of Enoch entities, whatever. But anyway, um, 40 prisoners still stands today as the oldest building in North End. In this way, Bell had virtually completed the original Gervois scheme by the time the Rowan Atkinson, a.k.a. Mr. Bean government, fell from office in 1891. Fort Takapuna and Fort Kotle on North Head were completed. The 8-inch Armstrong gun in the South Battery Oh, I love this. Oops. I love this one. I love this. Oh, don't miss this. Where'd it go? Oh, where is it? Where'd it go? Oh, yeah. Um, Takapuna Fort Cartley North Head were completed. The 8-inch Armstrong gun in the South Battery stamped with the name Arthur Bell, 16th of February, 1889, as a testament to the date of its emplacement. Sure. I believe you. Lie to me. Lie to me. I promise I believe you. So it's a joke. So, um, <laughs> this is so funny. Confident in the suspicion that a definitive assessment of New Zealand's defense requirements was elusive. So that was the, after all that, they review themselves and they say, well, you know, I just have to say, uh, I'm just getting a divergent opinion on the viability of the harbor defenses throughout the 1890s. I'm confident in my suspicion that a definitive assessment of New Zealand's defense requirements will remain elusive. A succession of commanding officers, Keystone Cops they're known as to, the New Zealand forces offer differing opinions and solutions. Well, well, well. The harbors, the harbor defenses built in the 1880s were state of the art for the time, but some of the equipment never became fully operational and none of the guns were ever fired. See, they could have taken a, um, taken a note from, uh, Emperor Palpatine, the evil emperor. You make it and you make it look like it's not fully operational. Behold and witness the power of this fully operational deflector shield. So, um, well, battle station, whatever. But then they say, the very existence of these defenses provided a deterrent against intrusion by an enemy ship. And more importantly, I should have highlighted that too, a reassurance to the public of the time that such an intrusion would be resisted. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that one got by me the first time. So he's saying, you know, the very fact that we kind of half-ass built these incomplete defenses um, was good because the enemy's not going to attack us if, if we're telling them, you know, that we have these defenses that we kind of didn't have, but we just kind of half-assed the existence of it. Well, no, it doesn't. That's the thing. It's the the the... the, the the structure was there, but it, they couldn't make it function because they just had, you know, dug it out. They cleared it out, cleaned it up a little bit, but they didn't know how it worked or if it was even for defenses or something else. It didn't matter because they told they told people and that were they told their enemies that yeah, this is a totally a defense thing, you know, that we got here going. And so, so they won't attack us. But more importantly, they told their own people reassuring words to the public of that time, that such an intrusion would be resisted. <laughs> so their plan was, 
we're, we, we have this stuff that kind of looks like defenses. It's not. But we're going to lie to our enemy uh, that we're going to make it sound and make it seem like they are defenses. But even better, we're going to lie to ourselves that the enemy won't attack us because we could defend such an intrusion. Even though, psst, hey, even though we, we actually couldn't defend an intrusion, but do, you know, well, don't tell anybody that, you know. We're not concerned. We're not concerned with actually defending ourselves. Come on. Unbelievable. Does it not compute in the traditional narrative? Of course, I think there's a completely different story. But I've told you that already. Bridge in conjunction with possible minefield. A possible minefield. So, you know, don't go across these waters. Don't walk across these lands because there's a possible minefield in place. But later on, yeah, you can walk. You can go there because the project was discontinued. And, oh, yeah, we totally moved the gun up on the on the battlement. But, you know, we moved it back somewhere else. So, you know. And, oh, that's funny. You had the gun there? I didn't remember. Oh, yeah, totally. We had the gun there, man. Yeah. That gun was up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, you know what? What? Well, you know what? We, uh, there's this one time we fired it once. And it was so loud that it broke windows. And the local residents were outraged, man. And they said, don't you fire that secret gun anymore. So we just kind of left it up there during the First World War. But we didn't have anybody there. Because, you know, why would you want somebody to operate the gun, you know, during an attack? You know, what's the point? And uh, so what was the site even ever used for? Well, the Royal Navy used it as an ammunition depot. Another excuse don't you go in there, kids. Don't you go in there. There's a bunch of explosive stuff. It'll blow you to smithereens. Don't you go exploring that. You're, it's, it's off limits. At this time, the gun pit and gun were filled with volcanic scoria. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, in case we do get attacked, if war breaks out overnight or anything, we're going to have to dig out the volcanic scoria that we buried it in. <laughs> we don't know why we buried it. We buried our defenses. Our defense structures, you know, with, you know, we put a bunch of bombs there and then we kind of buried it. And you know, maybe they took the bombs out before they buried it, but nobody knows. Just don't go over there and don't even ask. Don't even talk. Don't think about it. When the issue of ownership of land was raised in 1928, it was found that Mount Victoria had never been formally acquired by the Defense Department in the 19th century. So, you know, they were just building their, their national defense on someone's private property and they didn't bother to record anything of it in any documents, you know, because why would they do that? <laughs> it's not, it's totally not because it was already there and they didn't build it. Nah, that's not fishy at all. And these rail lines, oh my gosh, you know. Um, so what else did I want to show? I mean, they, it's just the evidence you do see, they're just clearing out a bunch of mud from stuff and the tracks seem to have already been there, you know. Buildings in place, fully built uh, this is a newer picture, but this shows you that they had motor vehicles and the place was still unused, brand new, empty. And you know, I wouldn't expect one picture to do it, but you look at all these. These are super old maps. 1841. 1841. This is the map. And the city is laid out in its entirety. The roads are built. Some of the roads are, you know, going, I don't know if that's like a tunnel in the middle, but this looks like what you would get today. You know what I mean? Like, and when it says plan before Brito Mart, that doesn't mean that it's only planned. And they could have written that later anyway, but the word plan also means like map, you know. Quality. It looks like almost like they blurred some of it out. But my gosh, if that thing wasn't there for a long time already, then Custom House Street. Amazing. No way did they build. Okay, let's review. I'm going to jump ahead here. Let's review about this area when people came in because I want you to 
understand if you didn't see the other video, and even if you did, it still bears additional attention that the place was settled around beginning around 1850. Beginning at. So, um, I'm going to find this. There's just one document that uh, says, Early in 1848, the Canterbury Association was formed and it was decided to name the capital city Christ Church. Now, I found on one map it said Kusherv or something. It sounded like Christ Church. So, obviously, that was the real name of the city, the first name of the city. Um, Part of the plan included the opportunity for the settlers to buy land. This would supply the money needed. Um, so where are the people? Well, uh, during the 1820s, 1830s, the local Maori population fell, and they give excuses for that. You know, European, with a wave of the hand, European diseases, measles, influenza, Hundreds of Maori died. There were only hundreds there. Um, the first attempt of settling the plains was made in 1840, but they left. Um, 63 French colonists came in 1840. Okay. Another family came in 1843. And in 1844, the first child of European descent was born there. And these rail lines, oh my gosh, you know. Um, so what else did I want to show? I mean, they, it's just... The evidence you do see, they're just clearing out a bunch of mud from stuff, and the tracks seem to have already been there, you know. Buildings in place, fully built. Uh, this is a newer picture, but this shows you that they had motor vehicles, and the place was still unused, brand new, empty. And, you know, I wouldn't expect one picture to do it, but you look at all these. These are super old maps. And the city is laid out in its entirety. The roads are built. Some of the roads are, you know, going, I don't know if that's like a tunnel in the middle, but this looks like what you would get today. You know what I mean? Like, and when it says plan a Fort Brito Mart, that doesn't mean that it's only planned. And they could have written that later anyway, but the word plan also means like map, you know, like a layout. But either way, this is from 1871. It shows, and then <laughs> the plan of Fort Brittemart showing also the location of the what? St. Paul's Church. This is 1871. Plan of Fort Britomart showing also the location of the old St. Paul's Church. And this was compiled in September of 1871, which means it predates that by a lot. You know, you don't compile. This is a compilation, a history, you know. I mean, it... This was all done at least a few years before 1871. Amazing evidence. Amazing evidence. I'm going to find this. There's just one document that uh, says, Early in 1848, the Canterbury Association was formed and it was decided to name the capital city Christ Church. Um, part of the plan included the opportunity for the settlers to buy land. This would supply the money needed. Um, so where are the people? Well, uh, during the 1820s, 1830s, the local Maori population fell, and they give excuses for that. 
you know, European with, with a wave of the hand, European diseases, measles, influenza, hundreds of Maori died. There were only hundreds there. Um, the first attempt of settling the plains was made in 1840, but they left. Um, 63 French colonists came in 1840. Okay. Another family came in 1843. And in 1844, the first child of European descent with the last name of Manson, which is similar to, well, same as Charles Manson and very close to Mason, Masonry, Freemasonry. So 1844, the first European child was born there. Um, I think we've had one child was born on Antarctica that we know of, right? Maybe a couple now. And that was decades ago, probably. But anyway, uh, 1844. Boy, they come a long way really fast. Amazing. Um, and they planned the towns. They didn't have money. They didn't have materials. They didn't have people. But somehow, they completely built the towns before the first four shiploads of settlers arrived and they, which had left England in September 1850. So when did they arrive? Because that's a long journey on a sailboat. But Oh, December the 16th, the first of the ships arrived in 1850. So basically we can say January 1851, and then I already showed you the accomplishments. Um, they built schools, churches, Newspapers, uh, they had newspapers all in 1851. They did all that stuff. It's in, just impossible. <laughs> it's a joke, people. What do they, honestly, I, I, to the New Zealand people, uh, what did they teach you in school about this stuff? I mean, this stuff doesn't make sense on the face of it. I'm sure they have stories and they work out something, but just going by the evidence, you know what I mean? Um. So then there's this picture, so these maps, very, very detailed. And now I wonder about this picture because there are a lot of people there in this picture, which is probably from the looks of it, it looks like it's from like the late 20s, maybe the 30s. It's hard to say. Of course, it could be from way before then. Could be. And... uh it sure is a lot of people, and it almost makes me wonder, like, is this the previous civilization, you know, that went away? I don't know. But it's probably not. It's probably just as many people as they could get together in one picture uh, from the present age, you know. Like, this is where when all the people are coming in, and they have a meeting of all the adults, you know, mostly the adults. You know, okay, you're in charge of this fake history and this uh, resettlement of the community. And we've told you not to ask about what happened to the previous people. And just remember to maintain that, uh, maintain silence on the issue and maintain the false narrative and take credit for building all this stuff, make up stories and, and discourage any talk, further talk about it. Because they had um, electric trolleys like everywhere. They had antennas. They had it all, man. They had there was communication all the way around. Um, and just even today, when they're digging stuff up, they find stuff. The old buildings are everywhere, and then the mark of the beast. You know the red and black satanic and. Look at this. Like, what are they flailing somebody on a sacrificial table there? I mean, what the heck? Who decided to put that image, those images up? Does it mean something other than what it looks like? I hope so. Looks like a human sacrifice on a table. And that's the artwork that the city puts up when they're blocking off something. 
that uh, obviously shows that the level of the street doesn't match and it probably has steps and things that just don't match uh, people's heights today and whatnot. No way. It was already there. This, they dug out something and then they just plopped on the cannon that they never used, took a picture. I mean, would you build it like that? I mean, look at that. That's the next rain is going to bury the thing in mud. And they said that they put volcanic ash or whatever that stuff was. They buried it purposely in that I mean, stuff doesn't make sense. And you look at the imagery and you can see that the forested areas and just the whole place was completely built up. You can see the structures, the, the remnants of the buildings and the fences and the roads and then all these different roads to nowhere, you know, Oh, unfinished road to some city that, you know, would you do that? Would you build a road off some direction and then just have it end into the wilderness, let it be overgrown and make maps and say road to, and then have some name of some city that wouldn't, that doesn't exist. Would you do that? Would anybody do that? When you're so busy, you're a settler, you're a pioneer. You, I mean, you're, you're having to make your own food. You, you have to quarry your own stone. You know, I just let the prisoners do that. They'll do it for you. No problem. And the church, all this stuff's destroyed. This downtown is gone. Streetcars, I don't know if they're still running. I mean, I think the streetcars might be, but only in the downtown area when they used to go all over. Because the city destroyed all of its, you know, seemingly, apparently old buildings, <laughs> as they say. You know, because the settlers... You know, the settlers decided to build things out of finished marble and stone, not use it for the most part. It was way over capacity. And by the time the population grew in to where it was um, in a good capacity to be able to fill these buildings, they were still disused, abandoned because they were old. They're beautiful buildings and they could be retrofitted and fixed up. So some of them were, and like the churches, you know, and then the ones that were used, well, when the earthquake struck, oh, it's unstable, unsuitable, it's dangerous, it's off limits, nobody can go there, and then they block it off so you can't even see it, and they tell you that, you know, the old buildings got affected by the earthquake. The earthquake didn't affect the new buildings, no. The new buildings built on sandy ground. The new buildings built on flood debris. No, they were fine for the most part. It's the old buildings that fell down. Not the one with the dinosaur painted on the side. I mean, if that doesn't tell you that they do not value your town, they, the, the your own city's managers are paid half about half a million dollars a year but as the earthquake didn't do enough damage then they just kind of used their authority to tear down all the nice buildings replace the downtown with crappy shipping containers and uh then they got a pay raise oh and they were on vacation too during everything people have to be so upset about that there so, um, there was this, uh, with some of the notes on the issue of the, the land grab, you know, because they had some legal problems and egg on their face with respect to the fact that there are all these structures on these landowners' properties that weren't declared because there's no record of them being built create some legal trouble. And uh, I just wanted to point out one more thing with that. And that is, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff with this. 
but um, it was this word. So the first 33 pages of the high court decision contains not surprisingly extensive findings from of fact from the thousands of pages of documents put in evidence, although the rest of the decision is littered with findings littered, littered with fact and law. That's litter of the long and desultory history of the roads. Desultory, they say. So I had to look that one up because even I, your host, the UAP, am not omniscient. I do not know all. Uh, and that word, I, when I looked it up, lacking a plan, purpose, or enthusiasm. A few people were left dancing in a desultory fashion. Alternatively, it means going constantly from one subject to another in a half-hearted way, unfocused. The desultory conversation faded. Um, it's casual, cursory, superficial, token, perfunctory, half-hearted, lukewarm, random, aimless, erratic, unmethodical unsystematic, chaotic, inconsistent, irregular, intermittent, sporadic. So what are they talking about again? They're talking about the history of the roads. They're talking about facts. They're talking about evidence about the structures and roads and everything built on these lands. I mean, that, that's, that's some of the best right there. Their own government, you know, government, and it's, it's human nature. You make yourself sound better. You put your best foot forward. You try to make the best first impression you can, that kind of stuff. And the government lies, and the government lies especially about itself and paints itself, and that's what propaganda is. But even the government talking about its own self in dealings with these tunnels and these other things, they just say that they're incompetent. They say about themselves that they they have a, a, a an irregular, inconsistent record and that their dealings were aimless and nonsensical. <laughs> 